Here we go. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we're going to examine the scientific approach to trading and to market analysis and to technical analysis. With me is David Aronson. David is the author of this classic book called Evidence-Based Technical Analysis, and he's also the author of another new book, called Statistically Sound Machine Learning for Algorithmic Trading of Financial Instruments. David is a former adjunct professor at Baruch College School of Business in New York. He's also a former proprietary trader with Spear, Leeds, and Kellogg, one of the largest trading firms in the country. Now, as I understand, it's part of Goldman Sachs. Welcome, David. So, David, I understand that when you started uh, trading and studying technical analysis, you were a teenager. And at that time, uh, even though the name technical analysis impresses one as being rather scientific, it was not. Exactly. And I didn't realize it until much later on that, um, that what a lot of the books that I read were saying were people really re just regurgitating what they had read in other books uh, that they hadn't it wasn't really based upon their own research that they had done in some cases it was but for the most part people were just regurgitating what they had learned from the from the old masters mm -hmm. and uh, you you studied and practiced this form of technical analysis I gather for many years well actually I followed uh, two paths in parallel. I started out doing conventional technical analysis and then uh, when I was working as a stockbroker for Merrill Lynch in the 1970s, uh, a man who I was trying to uh, entice into becoming one of my clients was a retired engineer from Boeing and he introduced me to the idea of statistical pattern recognition and that immediately made sense to me as a way to approach technical analysis and that's what he was that's what he was starting to do so that set me off on a parallel path of not only doing it in the old school way but trying to bring computers into the picture well and, and computers cer certainly added a lot of rigor to the field of technical analysis but in your opinion would you say computers were sufficient to turn technical analysis into a scientific discipline they're, I think they're a necessary, but they're not a sufficient condition. That in addition to having a lot of computing power, which can be just used to doing technical analysis in the conventional way faster, um, you also need to have the statistical uh, concepts and the epistemological concepts, the, the, the approach to gaining knowledge from um, observational data that's part of the scientific method. So it's, it's a combination of having the machine horsepower and having the, the intellectual framework of the scientific method and statistical inference. Let's talk about the scientific method and how um, it contains certain essential features that are not always found in the practice of uh, technical analysis or other approaches to trading as well. I, I think one of the things that really distinguishes the scientific method from common sense intuitive approaches to learning about the world is it starts off with an assumption that it starts off with a uh, assumption of of skepticism uh, and in order to accept something as new knowledge it really has to prove itself whereas the, without the rigor of the scientific method our minds are too readily uh, too ready to fall into a state of belief about something that we see based upon too little evidence. Well, and it seems as if our, our brains are designed to, to recognize patterns. Uh, sometimes uh, even when those patterns may not be um, long-lasting. And there's great survival value in having that ability to discern patterns in what we see around us uh, and for the most part it functions very well and I, I forget who said it that it's it's a lot um, riskier to miss a pattern 
such as the rustling of grass and there being a predator waiting to eat us uh, hiding in the, in, the, in the bushes, it's a lot riskier to miss a pattern than to perhaps see a pattern that's really bogus. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the kinds of patterns that superstition are believed, based upon. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it does strike me that, uh, the, that I think many traders would say it's more of an art than a science. I don't think there's a hard line between science and art because there's certainly artful aspects of science. For example, the whole uh, first step in the scientific method of conjuring up a, a hypothesis, that is uh, not really covered by how to practice science. It comes up as a product of intuition and experience and um, some people are better at it than others and some people say that that's an art. Mm -hmm. Well, there are other features to the scientific method uh, that I would like to be more specific about. One, for example, is the application of statistics and, and the idea of uh, disproving a null hypothesis. C can you elaborate on that? Yeah, the, the way that common sense tends to work is we form some belief about the world, a hypothesis, and then we start looking for evidence that confirms it and we tend to accept it on that basis. But the scientific method approaches things differently. It says, all right, let's, let's propose a hypothesis, but let's start out with another hypothesis called the null hypothesis, which states the opposite. In other words, uh, when Jonas Salk was researching the polio vaccine, he started out with the hypothesis that the polio vaccine he invented did not work. And then he set about trying to come up with evidence that disproved that hypothesis, because if you can disprove the null hypothesis, you're left with its alternative, which is that it does work. Mm -hmm. So the scientific method starts out with the notion that the new, the new thing we think we've discovered really doesn't work or it's not real. And then the burden of proof is on that new discovery to show that it really does work. And the way that that happens is that we can from the hypothesis, uh, make a prediction about what we should see if the hypothesis is true. And then we go about performing some experiment or doing an observational study to see whether that prediction is in fact true or not. Mm -hmm. and, and there are statistical means for determining the uh, probability by which the null hypothesis is rejected. Uh, exactly. That's the thing that statisticians call the p-value, uh, that when we're making an observation on the world, really all we have is a sample of data. And it's very easy for a sample of data to be off simply as a result of random variation. So we, in order to see an effect that we really believe in, we have to see an effect that's large enough or far enough away from what the null hypothesis predicts to say, okay, what we've observed is so different than what we would have expected if the null were true, in other words, that we have not made a genuine new discovery, that we can then safely reject the null. Mm -hmm. So in, in a sense, we're dealing not only with statistics here, but we're dealing with probability theory. Uh, very definitely. Statistics is very much uh, involved with probability theory because typically we're making observations on a random variable. and random variables vary randomly and we need to make sure that when we see a real result it's far enough outside the range of random variation that we can say this is not just due to random variation it's due to a real effect mm -hmm. and and one of your concerns i gather with regard to the practice of technical analysis is that there's there's a human tendency to look at random patterns and to project uh, meaning onto them and in fact I know some experiments have been done with stock charts that were uh, generated using uh, random numbers and uh, professional technical analysts weren't able to distinguish them from actual stock charts. That's true, that's true. I uh, used to start my class off every year by giving out this uh, random versus real test and when the students could not tell the difference I warned them that by the end of the course, they still wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. But but there's that tendency again, um, seeing patterns in randomness. That's that overly aggressive 
tendency that's very valuable for us generally to see patterns. Mm -hmm. And uh, because in the real world, we're we're dealing with things where uh, there really are well-behaved phenomena, like, for example, a predator perhaps waiting to eat us, and it's very useful to be able to pick that up and so if you occasionally hear a rustle in the grass and it turns out to just be the wind well there's no big cost in that mm -hmm. but this carries over into the modern world where we're dealing with phenomena in certain cases like financial markets that are very much uh... random there's a large component of randomness some people say it's all random uh... and there's that habit to see a pattern even in what's random, the so-called bunny in the clouds effect. Yeah. We look up and see something in the sky that looks like a bunny. We know it isn't, but our pattern recognition apparatus says, wow, that, that looks like a, a bunny up there. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to uh, testing uh, various trading strategies, trading rules, and uh, trading systems in addition to having proper statistical controls and a proper understanding of probability theory it's also necessary uh, to control for other uh, extraneous influences that might uh, cause a, an artifact in the data well yeah uh, one of the one of the big effects is because we have so much computer power now that it allows people to test many, many different ideas. Mm -hmm. And that introduces a, a bias that can be a real problem, that can convince you that you found a trading system that's really profitable when, in fact, it's just luck. Mm -hmm. and, and this occurs in, in many areas of science, I know, where they're doing uh, multifactorial designs and testing dozens of hypotheses at the same time. If you're testing 20 hypotheses, one uh, of those by chance alone should be significant at the 0.05 level, which is the normal cutoff for uh, in the behavioral sciences for considering something statistically significant. The effect is because we have so much computer power now that it allows people to test many, many different ideas. Mm -hmm. And that introduces a, a bias that can be a real problem, that can convince you that you found a trading system that's really profitable when, in fact, it's just luck. Mm -hmm. and, and this occurs in, in many areas of science, I know, where they're doing uh, multifactorial designs and testing dozens of hypotheses at the same time. If you're testing 20 hypotheses, one uh, of those by chance alone should be significant at the 0.05 level, which is the normal cutoff for uh, in the behavioral sciences for considering something statistically significant. Yeah, and that needs to be taken into account. The number of different trading systems or hypotheses or variables that you're examining need to be considered when you're deciding whether you found something of statistical significance. And, and another major problem that seems to come up when people develop trading systems, especially people just starting, has to do with uh, data snooping. I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Well. An aspect of data snooping is, is what we just spoke about, the fact that you're looking through many, many different hypotheses, but it comes about in a more insidious way. And that is that, um, particularly when you're reading published research, the and there are many journals now that publish this type of empirical financial market research, the articles that you're reading have already been looked over by the editors of the journal and they've had a chance to look at many many submissions before they decide well, well this is an interesting article we'll put it in the journal and they've discarded many others we don't know how many others they've discarded but yet the number that were thrown away is very critical in deciding whether or not what appears in the journal is of any significance or not mm -hmm. and so that's it's more, a more insidious problem because we don't know how many uh, articles were as they say, kept in the file drawer. It, right, the file drawer problem, yeah.